And welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I shall be your reader today. I'm going to start today with the word discovery. Discovery. In one's life, of course, there are surely many moments of discovery. Discovery of self always tops the list, of course. Most of us spend a lifetime striving to discover key aspects of ourselves, who and why in particular. Then there are those lightning infused moments of discovery in every single area where humans are curious enough and passionate enough to want to know, to want to know why, what, how, how come. Discoveries of milestones in science and medicine, of course, have previously been unimaginable. And of course, we could go on to disciplines right, left, and center. Could this really be what I have dedicated so much of my life looking for? Have I discovered it? Among millions of other discoveries in innumerable areas of life on earth, discoveries of what is below and way above what the eye can see are for me particularly gobsmacking, as say the Brits. Space above the Earth's surface we walk on and below the waves that mesmerize us. Discovery. On the fifth day of last month, March 2022, a discovery was made. At 9,849 feet below the harsh Antarctic waves of the Waddle Sea, a ship was discovered nearly 106 years after it was crushed by ice and silently sunk to the bottom of the frigid sea floor. Someone with great passion and determination was curious enough to want to know some answers. And of course, this was not just any ship. There are surely many ships resting on the ocean's floor since before the ones were built and man set out to explore the world beyond. This grand, and specially reinforced ship sailed from London shipyard on August 1st, 1914, bound for the Kritviken, let me say it right, Kritviken whaling station on the island of South Georgia, on the edge of the threatening Waddle Sea, arriving on November 5. Now on December 5, 1914, it set sail for the Antarctic with a crew of 28 sailors, scientists, doctors, and one highly respected commander whom the men called Boss. That date was the last contact with the outside world for 18 months. The world would later learn that nearly one year after its departure from South Georgia Island on November 1915, the great ship carrying the highest of hopes of its crew to be the first men to cross the Antarctic on foot was trapped in a sea of enormous crushing ice and sank to its watery grave. All 28 men successfully abandoned the ship in time, along with their 69 sledding dogs, finding themselves with limited food and supplies, 
on constantly moving ice flows 800 miles from civilization and 1,000 miles from the South Pole, surrounded by nearly a million square miles, a million of packed ice, and with no communication system. Following a harrowing nine months of incredible hardship in well below freezing temperature, thrown about in three foot small lifeboats, uh, three, three small light boats of 23 feet on tumultuous seas dodging enormous sail, uh, whales, all 28 men miraculously survived and reached safety back on South Georgia Island in August of 1916, nearly two years later. Well, probably put two and two together by now, but the failed expedition was named the Imperial Transatlantic Expedition. The name of the boss was the now famous and infamous Sir Ernest Shackleton. The name of the ship was the Endurance. The name of today's featured book saluting the Camden Public Library's Maritime Month is called Endurance, Shackleton's Incredible Voyage by a man named Alfred Lansing. And what nearly unbelievable discoveries abound in the story. Discoveries about the resiliency, the determination, the courage of man, the brutal forces of nature on a sea far, far away. And now the discovery of the ship that fought hard to survive, but failed. The endurance was finally discovered days after the 100th anniversary of Sir Ernest Shackleton's passing on January 5, 1922. Incredible. But before exploring the story to be told, let's consider some facts about the author, most unique facts actually, Alfred Mark Lansing had one single great passion and literary accomplishment in his life. The incredible voyage of Sir Ernest Shackleton in 1914 to 1916 and a focused passion it was indeed. Lansing was an American journalist and writer uh, Endurance, Shackleton's Incredible Voyage, published in 1959, was his first of only two books in his career. A native of Chicago, Lansing was born in 1921, and a little over 21 years later graduated with honors in journalism from Northwestern University. He edited a weekly newspaper in Illinois for seven years before joining the United Press, becoming a freelance writer in 1952. And then the move to New York City for Time, Inc. and Collier's Magazine, specializing in adventure stories. Given his longtime personal interest in polar studies, therein lies the link, Lansing applied and was admitted as a member of the Cambridge, England-based Scott Polar Research Institute in 1957. It's undoubtedly from this keen interest that he would come to learn about the Antarctic ordeal of Shackleton and his team of 27 other men that would ultimately evolve into his best-selling novel. In 
Eventually, Lansing returned to Chicago to become the editor of the Bethel Home News, where he remained until his passing in 1975 at the young age of 54. He had accomplished his goal. He wrote this book. And while researching the book, Endurance, Lansing spoke with 10 of the expedition's surviving members and was granted access to the journals and personal diaries of eight others in order to gain so incredible a complete view of the expedition. Alfred Lansing's book was nominated for the National Book Award for Nonfiction in 1960. So, The Endurance, an unlikely novice writer, writes a great bestseller in 1959. I'd like to share a trio of very brief quotes from a Sir Ernest Shackleton, uh, just to give you a little more insight into the man um, who is the story of the book. The first one actually <laughs> is the job available advertisement in the London newspapers, um, even while the ship was being built. And here is how he said it, men wanted for hazardous journey, period, small wages, comma, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. <laughs> I'm not sure if I would have answered that <laughs> myself, but he had oodles of people responding to that ad far more than you might expect. I think there were 350 and he was only going to select 25 because friends he had worked with before were already on the ship's roster. Here's a, a deeper one. Loneliness is the penalty of leadership, but the man who has to make the decisions is assisted greatly if he feels there is no uncertainty in the mind of those who follow him and that his orders will be carried out confidently and expect, in, in expectation of success. And therein lies the key to this book. And this story is all 27 men highly respected the man, they called him the boss. At every task he assigned them, as soon as they were finished, they would go back to him and say, now what boss? So it's a secret to how these 28 men possibly survived. And at the end, his very famous quote, we had seen God in his splendors, heard the text that nature renders. We had reached the naked soul of man. <sighs> the book is brilliant. <laughs> My overall note before we begin, it's an amazing book about the dignity and the discovery of man in adventure, survival, and victory. You can tell I highly recommend it. <laughs> so we're going to begin the book uh, right at the very beginning. He has a most clever start to this book. You might think that we would talk about other uh, adventures that had already happened in reaching the Antarctic by other people. Uh, or we might talk about the Antarctic itself and, and the South Pole, uh, or the building of the ship, or the recruitment of the men, or whatever. Not so. He has a very unique start. So I'm beginning at the beginning of the book, Endurance Shackleton's Incredible Voyage in Honor of Maritime Month. Chapter one. The order to abandon ship was given at 5 p.m. For most of the men, however, no order was needed because by then everybody knew that the ship was done and that it was time to give up try trying to save her. 
There was no sure show of fear or even apprehension. They had fought increasingly for three days unceasingly, and they had lost. They accepted their defeat almost apathetically. They were simply too tired to care. Frank Wilde, the second in command, made his way forward along the buckling deck to the crew's quarters. There, two seamen, Walter Howe and William Bakewell, were lying in the lower bunks. Both were very nearly exhausted from almost three days at the pumps. Yet they were unable to sleep because of the sounds the ship was making. She was being crushed, not all at once, but slowly, a little at a time. The pressure of 10 million tons of ice was driving against her sides. And dying as she was, she cried in agony. Her frames and planking, her immense timbers, many of them almost a foot thick, screamed as the killing pressure mounted. And when her timbers could no longer stand the strain, they broke with a report like artillery fire. Most of the forecastle beams had already gone earlier in the day and the deck was heaved upward and working slowly up and down as the pressure came and went. Wilde put his head inside the crew's quarters. He spoke quietly. She's going, boys. I think it's time to get off. Howe and Bakewell rose from their bunks, picked up two pillowcases in which they had stowed some personal gear, and followed Wilde back up on deck. Wilde next went down into the ship's tiny engine room. Kerr, the second engineer, was standing at the foot of the ladder, waiting. With him was Rickinson, the chief engineer. They had been below for almost 72 hours, maintaining steam in the boilers to operate the engine room pumps. During that time, though they couldn't actually see the ice in motion, they were altogether aware of what it was doing to the ship. Periodically, her sides, though they were two feet thick in most places, bowed inward six inches under the pressure. Simultaneously, the steel floor plates jammed together, screeching where their edges met, then buckling up and suddenly overriding one another with a sharp metallic report. Wilde did not pause long. Let down your fires, he said, she's going. Kerr looked relieved. Wilde turned aft to the propeller shaftway. There, McNeish, the old ship's carpenter, and McCloyd, a seaman, were busy with torn pieces of blankets, caulking a coffer dam built by McNeish the day before. It had been thrown up in an attempt to stem the flow of water coming into the ship where the rudder and the stern post had been torn out by the ice. But the water now was almost up to the floor plates and it was gaining faster than the coffer dam could hold it back and faster than the pumps could carry it away. Whenever the pressure ceased for a moment, there was the sound of the water running forward and filling up the hold. Wilde signaled to the two men to give up. Then he climbed the ladder to the main deck. Clark, Hussey, James, and Wordy had been at the pumps, but they had quit on their own, realizing the futility of what they were doing. Now they sat on cases of stores or on the deck itself and leaned against the bulwarks. Their faces showed the unspeakable toil of the past three days at the pumps. Farther forward, the dog team drivers had attached a large piece of canvas to the port rail and made it into a sort of chute down to the ice alongside the ship. They took the 49 huskies from their kennels, 
and slid each one down to other men waiting below. The other 20 dogs as backup followed. Ordinarily, any activity of this sort would have driven the dogs mad with excitement, but somehow they seemed to sense that something very extraordinary was going on. No one fight, no one fight broke out among them and not a single dog attempted to break away. It was perhaps the attitude of the men. They worked with a deliberate urgency hardly speaking to one another. There was no display of alarm, however. In fact, apart from the movement of the ice and the sounds from the ship, the scene was one of relative calm. The temperature was eight and a half degrees below zero and a light southerly wind was blowing. Overhead, the twilight sky was clear. But somewhere, Far away in the south, a gale was blowing toward them. Though it probably wouldn't reach their position for at least two days, its approach was suggested by the movement of the ice, which stretched as far as the eye could see, and for hundreds of miles beyond that. So immense was the ice pack and so tight that though the gale had not yet reached them, the distant pressure of its winds was already crushing the flows together. The whole surface of the ice was a chaos of movement. It looked like an enormous jigsaw puzzle, the pieces stretching away to infinity and being shoved and crunched together by some invisible but irresistible force. The impression of its titanic power was heightened by the unhurried deliberateness of the motion. Wherever two thick flows came together, their edges butted and ground against one another for a time. Then, when neither of them showed signs of yielding, they rose slowly and often quiveringly, driven by the implacable power behind them. Sometimes they would stop abruptly as the unseen force of affecting the ice appeared mysteriously to lose interest. More frequently though, the two flows, often 10 feet thick or more, would continue to rise, tenting up until one or both of them broke and toppled over, creating a pressure ridge. There were the th sounds of the pack in movement, the basic noises, the grunting and whining of the ice flows, along with an occasional thud as a heavy block collapsed. But in addition, the pack under compression seemed to have an almost limitless repertoire of other sounds, many of which seemed strangely unrelated to the noise of ice undergoing pressure. Sometimes there was a sound like a gigantic train with squeaky axles being shunted roughly about with a great deal of bumping and chattering. <clears throat> At the same time, a huge ship's whistle blew, mingling with the crowing of roosters, the roar of a distant surf, the soft throb of an engine far away and the moaning cries of an old woman. In the rare periods of calm, when the movement of the pack subsided for a moment, the muffled rolling of drums drifted across the air. In this universe of ice, nowhere was the movement greater or the pressure more intense than in the flows that were attacking the ship. Nor could her position have been worse. One flow was jammed solidly against her starboard bow and another held her on the same side aft. A third flow drove squarely in on her port beam opposite. The us, the ice was working to break her in half, directly amidships. On several occasions, she bowed to starboard along her entire length. Forward, where the worst of the onslaught was concentrated, the ice was inundating her. It piled higher and higher against her bows as she repelled each new wave until gradually it mounted to her bulwarks, then crushed, crashed across the deck, overwhelming her with a crushing load that pushed her head down even deeper. Thus held, 
she was even more at the mercy of the flows striving against her flanks. The ship reacted to each fresh wave of pressure in a different way. Sometimes she simply quivered briefly as a human being might wince if seized by a single stabbing pain. Other times she retched in a series of convulsive jerks accompanied by anguished outcries. On these occasions, her three masts whipped violently back and forth as the ringing tightened like harp strings. But most agonizing for the men were the times when she seemed a huge creature, suffocating and gasping for breath, her sides heaving against the strangling pressure. More than any other single impression in those final hours, all the men were struck almost to the point of horror by the way the ship behaved like a giant beast in its death agonies. At 7 p.m., all essential gear had been transferred to the ice and a camp of sorts had been established on a solid flow a short distance to starboard. The lifeboats had been lowered the night before. As they went over the side onto the ice, most of the men felt immense relief at being away from the doomed ship, and few, if any of them, would have returned to her voluntarily. However, a few unfortunate souls were ordered back to retrieve various items. One was Alexander Macklin, a stocky young physician who also happened to be the driver of a dog team. He had just tethered his dogs at the camp when he was told to go with Wilde to get some lumber out of the ship's forehold. The two men started out and had just reached the ship when a great shout went up from the campsite. The flow on which the tents were pitched was itself breaking up. Wilde and Macklin rushed back. The teams were harnessed and the tents Stores, sledges, and all the gear were hurriedly moved to another flow a hundred yards farther from the ship. By the time the transfer was completed, the ship seemed on the point of going under. So the two men hurried to get aboard. They picked their way among the blocks of ice littering the forecastle, then lifted a hatch leading down into the forepeak. The ladder had been wrenched from its supports and had fallen to one side. To get down, they had to lower themselves hand over hand into the darkness. The noise itself was indescribable. The half empty compartment like a giant sounding box amplified every snapping bolt and splintering timber. From where they stood, the sides of the ship were only a few feet away, and they could hear the ice outside battering to break through. They waited for a moment until their eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, and what they saw then was terrifying. The uprights were caving in, and the cross members overhead were on the verge of going, it looked as if some giant vice were being applied to the ship and slowly tightened until she could no longer hold out against its pressure. The lumber they were after was stored in the black dark recesses of the side pockets in the very bow of the ship. To reach it, they had to crawl through a thwart ship's bulkhead and they could see that the bulkhead itself bulged outward as if it might burst at any moment, causing the whole forecastle to collapse around them. Macklin hesitated for just a moment, and Wild, sensing the other's fear, shouted to him above the noise of the ship to stay where he was. Then Wild plunged through the opening and a few minutes later began passing boards out to Macklin. The two men worked with feverish speed, but even so the job seemed interminable. Macklin was sure they would never get the last board out in time, but finally Wilde's head reappeared through the opening. They hoisted the lumber up on de deck, climbed out, and stood for a long moment without speaking, savoring the exquisite feeling of safety. Later, to the privacy of his diary, Mac confided 
I do not think I have ever had such a horrible, sickening sensation of fear as I had whilst in the hold of that breaking ship. Within an hour after the last man was off, the ice pierced her sides. Sharp spears drove through first, opening wounds that let in whole blocks and chunks of ice. Everything from midships forward was now submerged. The entire starboard side of the deck house had been crushed by the ice with such force that some empty gasoline cans stacked on deck had been shoved through the deck house wall and halfway across to the other side, carrying before them a large framed picture that had hung on the wall. Somehow the glass on the front had not broken. Later, after things had settled down at the camp, a few men returned to look at the derelict that had been their ship, but not many. Most of them huddled in their tents, cold through and tired, for the time being indifferent to their fate. The general feeling of relief at being off the ship was not shared by one man, at least not in the larger sense. He was a thick set individual with a wide face and a broad nose, and he spoke with a trace of an Irish brogue. During the hours it took to abandon the ship, he had remained more or less a part of the equipment dogs and men were gotten off the ship. His name, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> his name, you know, <coughs> excuse me. His name was Sir Ernest Shackleton, and the 27 men he had watched so ingloriously leaving their stricken ship were the members of his Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. The date was October 27, 1915. The name of the ship was Endurance. The position was 69 degrees 5 south and 51 degrees 30 west deep in the icy wasteland of the Antarctic's treacherous Weddell Sea, just about midway between the South Pole and the nearest known outpost of humanity, some 1,200 miles away. Few men have borne the responsibility Shackleton did at that moment. Though he certainly was aware that their situation was desperate, he could not possibly have imagined then the physical and emotional demands that ultimately would be placed upon them, the rigors they would have to endure, the sufferings to which they would be subjected. They were, for all practical purposes, alone in the frozen Antarctic seas. It had been very nearly a year since they had last been in contact with civilization. Nobody in the outside world knew they were in trouble, much less where they were. They had no radio transmitter with which to notify any would-be rescuers. And it is doubtful that any rescuers could have reached them, even if they had been able to broadcast an SOS. It was 1915, and there were no helicopters, no weasels, no snowcats no suitable planes. Thus their plight was naked and terrifying in its simplicity. If they were to get out, they had to get themselves out. Shackleton estimated the shelf ice off the Palmer Peninsula, the nearest known land, to be 182 miles west southwest of them. But the land itself was 210 miles away was inhabited by neither human beings nor animals and offered nothing in the way of relief or rescue. The nearest known place where they might at least find food and shelter was tiny Paulet Island, less than a mile and a half in diameter, which lay 346 miles northwest across the heaving pack of ice. There in 1903, 12 years before, the crew of a Swedish ship had spent the winter and after their vessel, the Antarctic, had been crushed by the Weddell Sea ice. 
The ship which finally rescued that party deposited its stock of stores on Paulet Island for the use of any later castaways. Ironically, it was Shackleton himself who had been commissioned at the time to purchase those stores. And now, a dozen years later, it was he who needed them. Chapter two. Shackleton's order to abandon ship while it signaled the beginning of the greatest of all Antarctic adventures also sealed the fate of one of the most ambitious of all Antarctic expeditions. The goal of the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, as its name implies, was to cross the Antarctic continent over land from west to east. Evidence of the scope of such an undertaking is the fact that after Shackleton's failure, the crossing of the continent remained untried for fully 43 years until 1957-1958. Then, as an independent enterprise conducted during the International Geophysical Year, Dr. Vivian E. Fuchs led the Commonwealth Transantarctic Expedition on the trek. And even Fuchs, though his party was equipped with heated tracked vehicles and powerful radios and guided by reconnaissance planes and dog teams, was strongly urged to give up. It was only after a torturous journey lasting nearly four months that Fuchs did in fact achieve what Shackleton set out to do in 1915. This was Shackleton's third expedition to the Antarctic. He had gone first in 1901 as a member of the National Antarctic Expedition led by Robert F. Scott, the famed English explorer, which drove to 82 degrees 15 south latitude, 745 miles from the pole, the deepest penetration of the continent at that time. Then in 1907, Shackleton led the first expedition actually to declare the pole as its goal. With three companions, Shackleton struggled to within 97 miles of their destination and then had to turn back because of shortage of food. The return journey was a desperate race with death but the party finally made it and Shackleton returned to England, a hero of the empire. He was lionized wherever he went, knighted by his king and decorated by every major country in the world. He wrote a book and he went on a lecture tour which took him all over the British Isles, the United States, Canada, and much of Europe. But even before it was over, his thoughts had returned to the Antarctic. He had been within 97 miles of the pole and he knew better than anyone that was only a matter of time until such some expedition attained the goal that had been denied him. As early as March of 1911, he wrote to his wife, Emily from Berlin where he was on tour. I feel that another expedition, unless it crosses the continent, is not much. Meanwhile, an American expedition under Robert E. Perry had reached the North Pole in 1909. Then Scott on his second expedition in late 1911 and early 1912 was raced to the South Pole by the Norwegian Raoul Amundsen and beaten by a little more than a month. It was devastating to lose out, but that might have been only a bit of miserable luck. Had not Scott and his three companions died as they struggled weak and scurvy to return to their base. When the news of Scott's achievement and the tragic circumstances of his death reached England, the whole nation was saddened. The sense of loss was compounded by the fact that the British, whose record for exploration had been perhaps unparalleled among the nations of the earth, had to take a humiliating second best to Norway. 
Throughout these events, Shackleton's own plans for a transatlantic expedition, a transantarctic expedition, had been moving rapidly ahead. In an early prospectus designed to solicit funds for the undertaking, Shackleton played heavily on this matter of prestige, make it his, his primary argument for such an expedition. He wrote, from the sentimental point of view, it is the last great polar journey that can be made. It will be a greater journey from the journey to the pole and back, and I feel it is up to the British nation to accomplish this. For we have beat, been beaten at the conquest of the North Pole and beaten at the first conquest of the South Pole. There now remains the largest and most striking of all journeys, the crossing of the continent. Shackleton's plan was to take a ship into the Weddell Sea and land a sledging party of six men and 70 dogs near Vashel Bay, approximately 78 degrees south, 38, six degrees west. At more or less the same time, a second ship would put into McBurdo Sound in the Ross Sea, almost directly across the continent from the Weddell Sea base. The Ross Sea Party was to set down a series of food caches for their base, almost to the pole. While this was being done, the Weddell Sea Group would be sledging toward the pole, living, living on their own rations. From the south, they would proceed to the vicinity of the mighty Beardmore Glacier, where they would replenish their supplies. At the southernmost depot laid down by the Ross Sea Party, other caches of rations along the route would keep them supplied, and they arrived at the McMurdo Sound base. Such was the plan on paper, and it was typical of Shackleton. Purposeful, bold, and neat. He had not the slightest doubt that the expedition would achieve its goals. The whole undertaking was criticized in some circles as being too audacious, and perhaps it was. But if it hadn't been audacious, it wouldn't have been to Shackleton's liking. He was, above all, an explorer in the classic mold, utterly self-reliant, romantic, and just a little swashbuckling. He was now 40 years old, of medium height and thick of neck, with broad, heavy shoulders a trifle stooped, and dark brown hair parted in the center. He had a wide, sensuous, but expressive mouth that could curl into a laugh or tighten into the thin, fixed lines with equal facility. His jaw was like iron. His gray-blue eyes, like his mouth, comes, could come a light with fun or darken with a steely and frightening gaze. His face was handsome, though it often wore a brooding expression, as if his thoughts were somewhere else, which gave him at times a kind of darkling look. He had some hands, but his grip was strong and confident. He spoke softly and somewhat slowly in an infinite baritone and with just the recollection of a brogue from his county Kildare birth. Whatever his mood, whether it was gay and breezy or dark with rage, he had one pervading characteristic. He was purposeful. Cynics might justifiably contend that Shackleton's fundamental purpose in undertaking the expedition was simply the greater glory of Ernest Shackleton and the financial rewards that would accrue to the leader of a successful expedition of this scope. Beyond all that, these motives loomed large in Shackleton's mind. He was largely aware of social position and the important part that money laid in it. In fact, the abiding and unrealistic dream of his life, at least superficially, was to achieve a status of economic well being that would last a lifetime. He enjoyed fancying himself as a country gentleman, 
divorced from the workaday world with the inner leisure and wealth to do as he pleased. Shackleton came from a middle-class background, the son of a moderately successful physician. He joined the British Merchant Navy at the age of 16, and though he rose steadily through the ranks, this sort of step-by-step -step advancement grew progressively less appealing to his flamboyant personality. Then came two important events. The expedition with Scott in 1901 and his marriage to the daughter of a wealthy lawyer. The first introduced him to the Atlantic and his imagination was immediately captivated. The second increased his desire for wealth. He felt obliged to provide for his wife in the manner of which she was accustomed. The Antarctic and financial security became more or less synonyms in Shackleton's thinking. He felt that success was here, some marvelous stroke of daring, a deed which would capture the world's imagination, would open the door to fame, then riches. Between expeditions, he also pursued this financial masterstroke. He was perennially entranced with new schemes, each of which he knew he was sure would be the winner of the fortune. It would be impossible to list them all, but they included an idea to manufacture cigarettes, a surefire plan with his endorsement, a fleet of taxi cabs, mining in Bulgaria, a whaling factory, even digging her buried treasure. Most of this, his ideas never got beyond the talking stage and those that did were usually unsuccessful. Shackleton's unwillingness to succumb to the demands of everyday life and his insatiable excitement with unrealistic ventures left him open to the accusation of being basically immature and irresponsible. And very possibly we have by conventional standards, and he was. But the great leaders of historical record, the Napoleons, the Nelsons, the Alexanders, have rarely fitted any conventional mold. And it is perhaps an injustice to evaluate them in ordinary terms. There can be little doubt that Shackleton, in his way, was an extraordinary leader of men. Nor did the Antarctic represent to Shackleton merely the grubby means to a financial end. In a very real sense, he needed it. Something so enormous, so demanding, that it provided a touchstone for his monstrous ego and implacable drive. In ordinary circumstances, Shackleton's tremendous capacity for boldness and daring found almost nothing worthy of its pulling power. He was a Percheron draft horse harnessed to a child's wagon cart. But in the Antarctic, here was a burden which challenged every stem and atom of his strength. Thus, while Shackleton was undeniably out of place even inept in a great many everyday situations. He had a talent, a genius even, that he shared with only a handful of men throughout history, genuine leadership. He was, as one of his men put it, the greatest leader that ever came to God's earth, bar none. For all his blind spots and inadequacies, Shackleton merited this tribute for scientific leadership, give me Scott. For swift and efficient travel, Amundsen. But when you get, when you are in the hopeless situation, when there seems no way out, get down on your knees and pray to Shackleton. This then was the man who developed the idea of crossing the Antarctic continent on foot. The largest items needed for the expedition were the ships that would carry the two parties to the Antarctic. From Sir Douglas Mawson, the famous Australian explorer, Shackleton bought the Aurora, a stoutly built ship of the type then used for sealing. The Aurora had already been on two Atlantic expeditions. She was to carry the Ross Sea Party, 
under the command of Lieutenant Aeneas McIntosh, who had served aboard the Nimrod on Shackleton's 1907-09 expedition. Shackleton himself would command the actual transcontinental army operating from the Weddell Sea side of the continent. To obtain a ship for his group, Shackleton arranged a purchase from Lars Christensen, the Norwegian whaling magnate, a ship that Christensen had ordered built to carry polar bear hunting parties to the Arctic. Such parties were then becoming increasingly popular with the well-to-do. Christensen had had a partner in this would-be enterprise, Mr. L. Bar Baron de Gerlache. He was a Belgian who had been the leader of an Antarctic expedition in 1897 and was therefore able to contribute many helpful ideas concerning the construction of the ship. However, during the building of the vessel, de Gerlache ran into financial difficulties and was forced to back out. Thus deprived of his partner, Christensen was pleased when Shackleton offered to buy the ship. The final selling price was $67,000, was less than Christensen had paid to have the ship built, but he was willing to take the loss in order to further the plans of an explorer of Shackleton's stature. The ship had been named the Polaris. After the sale, Shackleton rechristened her endurance, in keeping with the motto of his family, fortitude ne vincimus, by endurance we conquer. As with all such private expeditions, finances for the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Exposition uh, were perhaps the primary headache. Shackleton spent the better part of two years lining up financial aid. The blessings of the government and of various scientific societies had to be obtained in order to justify the expedition as a serious scientific endeavor. And Shackleton, whose interest in science could hardly be compared to his love of explorations, went out of his way to, pl to play up this side of the undertaking. This was hypocrisy in a sense. Nevertheless, a capable staff of researchers was to go with the expedition. But despite all of his personal charm and persuasiveness, which was, un, which was considerable, Shackleton was disappointed time after time by promised grants of financial aid, which failed to materialize. He finally obtained some $120,000 from Sir James Caird, a wealthy Scottish jute manufacturer. And the government voted him a sum equal to about $50,000, while the Royal Geographical Society contributed a token 5,000 to signify in ship in general, though by no means complete approval of the expedition. Lesser gifts were obtained from Dudley Docker and Miss Janet Stancombe Wills, plus literally hundreds of other small contributions from persons all over the world. It was the custom, Shackleton also mortgaged the expedition in a sense by selling in advance the rights of whatever, whatever commercial properties the expedition might produce. He promised to write a book later about the trip. He said the rights to the motion pictures and still photographs that would be taken and he urged to give a big subject to these in return. In all these arrangements, there was one basic assumption that Shackleton would succeed. In contrast to the difficulties in obtaining a sufficient financial backing, finding volunteers to take part in the expedition proved simple. When Shackleton announced he plans he was deluged by more than 5,000 applications from persons including three girls who asked to go along. Artistic, uh, almost uh, without exception, these uh, volunteers were motivated wildly by the spirit of adventure, for the salaries offered very little more than token payments for the services expected. They ranged from about $240 a year for an able seaman, $1,000 
to $750 a year for the most experienced scientists. And even this in many cases would not to be paid until the end of the expedition. Shackleton felt that the privilege of being taken along was itself almost compensation enough, especially for the scientists for whom the undertaking offered an unmatched opportunity for research in their fields. Shackleton built the crew list around a nucleus of tested veterans. The top post was second in command, went to Frank Wilde, a very small but powerfully built man whose thin mousy hair was rapidly disappearing altogether. Wilde was a soft-spoken and easygoing individual on the surface, but he had a kind of inner toughness he had been one of Shackleton's three companions in the race for the pole in 1908 and 1909. And Shackleton had developed a tremendous respect for him and a personal liking for him. The two men in fact form a well-matched team. Wilde's loyalty to Shackleton was beyond question and his quiet, somewhat unimaginative disposition was a perfect balance for Shackleton's often whimsical and occasionally explosive nature. The birth of second officer aboard the Endurance was given to Thomas Crean, a tall, raw bone, plain spoken Irishman whose long service to the Royal Army had taught him the ways of unquestioning discipline. Crean had served with Shackleton on Scott's 1901 expedition, and he had also become a crewman aboard the Terra Nova, which had carried Scott's ill-fated 1910-1913 group to the Antarctic. Because of Crean's experience and strength, Shackleton planned to have him as the driver of a sledge team in the six-man transcontinental party. Alfred Cheatham, who shipped aboard as third officer, was Crean's opposite in appearance. He was a tiny man, even shorter than Wilde, with an unassuming, pleasant disposition. Shackleton spoke of Cheatham as the veteran of the Antarctic, since he had already been on three expeditions, including one with Shackleton and one with Scott. Then there was George Marston the expedition's 32-year-old artist. Marston, a boyish-faced, chubby man, had gone outstanding work on Shackleton's 1907-1909 trek. Unlike most of the others, he was a married man with children. The nucleus of veterans was completed when Thomas McCloy, a member of the 1907-1909 expedition, was signed on the endurance as a seaman. In the matter of selecting newcomers, Shackleton's methods would appear to have been almost capricious. If he liked the look of a man, he was accepted. If he didn't, the matter was closed. And these conditions were made with lightning speed. There is no record of any interview that Shackleton conducted with a prospective expedition member lasting much more than five minutes. Leonard Hussey, an irrepressible, peppery little individual, was signed as meteorologist, even though he had practically no qualifications for the position at the time. Shackleton simply thought Hussey looked funny, and the fact that he had recently returned from an expedition as an anthropologist to the torrid Sudan so appealed to Shackleton's sense of whimsy. Hussey immediately took an intensive course in meteorology and later proved to be the very proficient. Dr. Alexander Macklin, one of the two surgeons, caught Shackleton's face by replying when Shackleton asked him why he was wearing glasses. Many a wise man would look foolish without spectacles. And Reginald James was signed on as a physician and a physicist both after Shackleton inquired about the state of his teeth, whether he suffered from varicose veins, if he was good tempered, and if he could sing. At this last moment, James looked puzzled. Oh, uh, I don't mean any Caruso stuff, Shackleton assured him, but I assume you can shout a bit with the boys. Despite the instantaneous nature of these decisions, Shackleton's intuition for selecting compatible men rarely failed. The early morning of 1914, 
were spent acquiring the countless items of equipment, stores, and gears that would be needed. Sledges were designed in tents in the snow-covered uh, mountains of Norway. A new type of rations intended to prevent scurvy was tried out as they specially designed tents. By the end of July 1914, however, everything had been selected, tested, and stowed aboard the Endurance. She sailed from London's East India docks on August 1. But the tragical political events of those dramatic days not only eclipsed the departure of the Endurance, but even threatened the whole venture. Archduke Ferdinand of Austria had been assassinated on June 28. And exactly one month later, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. The power trail was lighted while the, endurance, the endurance lay anchored at the mouth of the Thames River. Germany declared war on France. Then on the very day that George V presented Shackleton with the Union Jack, to carry on the expedition, Britain declared war on Germany. Shackleton's position could hardly have been worse. He was damned if he did and damned if he didn't. He was just about to leave on an expedition he had dreamed about and worked toward for almost four years. Mass sums of money, much of it involving future commitments had been spent and countless hours had gone into planning and preparation. At the very time, he felt very strongly about doing his part in the war. He spent long hours debating what to do and he discussed the matter with several advisors, notably his principal backers. Finally, he reached a decision. He mustered the crew and explained what he wanted their approval to telegraph the Admiralty, placing the entire expedition at the disposal of the government. All hands agreed and the wire was sent. The reply was a one word telegram, proceed. Two hours later, there was a longer wire from Winston Churchill, then first Lord of the Admiralty, stating that the government desired the expedition to go on. That was 1914. And never did he expect what faced him in the following year and a half. The book gets exciting very quickly with ice flows that keep breaking up, tents that have to be moved, enormous winds, uh, incredible uh, difficulties. I strongly suggest the book. I just think it's a brilliant, exciting book. It's one of those books that you may not put down until you finish it. I did it in two seatings, which is very rare for me. Uh, and it's about 500 pages. No, I lied. It's only 300 pages. So you can do it in one seating. All right, endurance. Let's talk, if we may, about next week's book. Uh, we're going to go to short stories uh, next week at the request of some of our viewers. Uh, a marvelous book uh, with a marvelous title, really, My Father's Tears and other stories by John Updike. John Updike. The book was published in 2009, filled with short stories, and there were so many great things said about it. A classically Updike, said Newsday, written with fluidity and humor, intelligence and wit about the elusiveness of happiness, contentment, grace. The Seattle Times said a haunting collection of heart-wrenching narratives. The evocative nature of the stories of my father's tears echoes the melancholy of Chekhov, the romanticism of Wordsworth, and the mournful spirit of Yeats. And one more, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. My father's tears is vintage updike. Its honesty and courage vaulting it to the top tier of its author's many short story collections. Updike's array of awards includes two Pulitzer Prizes for fiction, two National Book Awards, 
three National Book Critics Circle Awards, the 1989 National Medal of Arts, the 2003 National Humanities Medal, and the Ray Award for the short story for Outstanding Achievement. The National Endowment for the Humanities selected Uptight to present the 2008 Jefferson Lecture, the US government's highest humanities honor. I think you'll enjoy these short stories, especially My Father's Tears. It's an absolutely beautiful story. Thank you so much for joining today and, and watching us. If you enjoyed this video, we do hope indeed that you will press the magic buttons like it and uh, consider sharing it with your friends. Uh, also, uh, please feel free to leave a comment. We received several comments from people about the book, about the particular author, and especially about suggestions for future books. Happy to read your favorite book. <laughs> um, I also encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel to stay on top of the enormous array of events happening and unfolding all the time at the Camden Public Library. April 3 through 9 is National Library Week, by the way. And if you enjoy the library's programs and services, this is a great time to show your support by making a donation to librarycamden.org slash donate. The library needs to raise $46,000 by June 30 to meet basic operating expenses. So they are very grateful for your help. And as a final salute to the library's Maritime Month, we thank you for staying with us during the world of endurance. I strongly recommend the book if you like exciting adventure and under almost impossible odds, discovery. It's all about discovery. Thank you so much. Have a great week ahead. And I hope you'll join us next week. Goodbye.